So what I was asked to discuss is to provide some updates regarding advances in the management of uh, patients with metastatic ER-positive breast cancer. Um, there has been a, f a few things that I think have gone on in the last year, and there's the promise of other things coming along, uh, as you'll see. And although this uh, font may be a little bit small, these are the recently, meaning 24 hours ago, updated uh, guidelines from the NCCN with respect to treatment options for patients with stage 4 ER-positive uh, breast cancer. And I would tell you that the things that have changed, even if you can't see it uh, particularly well, is there's the inclusion of palbocyclib on here based on a trial that I'll talk about and I'm sure you've heard. And then the other thing that is also there that was present on the last iteration is the inclusion of an mTOR inhibitor in select patients. So those are things that are sort of changing how our lists look when we think about endocrine therapy. If you go back 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we started thinking about using endocrine therapy only in sequence and as for, long, for as long as we could. And I think a theme that's emerging as we think about endocrine therapy going forward is this notion of combining endocrine therapy, not necessarily with other endocrine agents, but with distinct other entities like targeted therapies. And although there certainly is evidence that this may be a very uh, fruitful way of going in terms of improving patient outcome, it is changing the nature of endocrine therapy because you're starting to pick up some of the side effects of chemotherapy. So there are many ways of describing all the things that change. You can look at the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, a uh, number of publications that appeared uh, in the last couple of years looking at a variety of different malignancies. You can look at the breast cancer cases specifically, and it's pretty apparent that you start to identify a, a number of different mutations, and the mutations that are present are often variable depending on the intrinsic subtype. And certainly within the patients who have luminal-type breast cancers, uh, there is a predominance of abnormalities in PI3 kinase and that pathway in particular. And another way of looking at it are these so-called circus plots where you look at on the left, uh, as an example, an aromatase inhibitor sensitive tumor on the left where it looks pretty straightforward, not a whole lot going on. And then on the right, you can start to see all the changes that appear as a, a tumor cell or in the case of a patient with a tumor, how that tumor becomes more refractory and develops uh, mechanisms of resistance, resistance that may be accounted for by point mutations, chromosomal changes, mutations in particular genes. So as you um, put pressure on a tumor with different therapies and over time, the probability that you're going to have significant changes within the tumor cell are pretty great. And obviously, coming at the tumor cell, uh, whether you're talking about endocrine-sensitive breast cancer or other types, is probably not going to be solved with a single therapy that's going to overcome all these abnormalities with time. So my basic theme as I go through this short discussion is that we have some of the same actors in terms of the endocrine agents we've been using for several years, but what's new is there are a variety of new dance partners that we're starting to combine endocrine therapy with, looking for ways of either enhancing the effect of endocrine therapy or overcoming the resistance, or even perhaps thinking of it in terms of trying to prevent or delay the development of resistance. In this relatively simple yet complicated pathway, you can see that there are a number of ways that we think about a tumor cell different than we did in the old, very simplistic ER sitting, the receptor sitting on the outside of the cell, which is described as a circle, and in the inside there's the nucleus, and tamoxifen attaches to the estrogen receptor and something magic happens. Now we understand that there's a very intricate circuitry within the tumor cell. There's a lot of overlapping pathways, and a lot of those pathways drive through the PK, PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, and there's a lot of crosstalk and overlap between these pathways as uh, tumor cells develop resistance. And as I mentioned earlier, in ER-positive breast cancer, one of the most important pathways is the PI3 kinase pathway. Now, in that pathway, as you can see here, there are um, a number of different drugs, and this list is probably not even completely up to date at this point, uh, 
that are looking at ways of interfering with that pathway. And some of these agents are pure PI3 kinase inhibitors. Some are combination agents that uh, affect not only the PI3 kinase pathway, but, or the node, but also mTOR. Some are pure mTOR inhibitors. Some are uh, TORC1 or TORC2 inhibitors. And all of these drugs are being evaluated either in some cases as monotherapy, but in most cases in combination with other agents. And again, the, the, the goal in looking at patients with ER-positive breast cancer is to try and determine if you can overcome resistance that inevitably develops in these patients. So with that said, there were a couple of trials presented this year uh, that have looked at ways of um, uh, potentially integrating PI3 kinase inhibitors into treatment of patients with ER-positive breast cancer. Ian Kropp presented the first data from the Fergie trial. And it was also thought uh, initially when some of the first data came out with PI3 kinase inhibitors that if you found the patients who, ex who harbored that mutation in their tumor, these would be the patients most likely to derive benefit from a PI3 kinase inhibitor. To date, that hasn't necessarily been a consistent finding. And although that will be evaluated in this trial where they go back and look at the tissue samples to determine which tumors actually harbored a mutation, that was not the subject of uh, uh, Ian Kropp's presentation. So these were patients with ER-positive postmenopausal breast cancer. Uh, they could have gotten some chemotherapy, less than two prior endocrine therapies. And they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either fulvestrant alone or fulvestrant plus the PI3 kinase inhibitor referred to as pictolisib, and it also has another name. And patients were continued on therapy until the disease progression occurred, and for those who did not get the PI3 kinase inhibitor, they did have an opportunity to cross over at the time of disease progression. Uh, the overall effect of this strategy is shown here. The progression-free survival was not uh, tremendously different. There was a smidgen of advantage for the addition of a PI3 kinase inhibitor that did come at not an insignificant cost of GI toxicity and uh, rashes that were experienced by patients, necessitating uh, dose reductions in a significant fraction of patients. And this gets back to my earlier comment that as we look at whether it's PI3 kinase inhibitors, whether it's palbocyclib, which I'll talk about in a few moments, um, uh, you start to pick up some side effects that seem more characteristic of chemotherapy. So when we talk to our patients, we have to be aware of this because it's not like giving somebody just an AI alone or tamoxifen alone or fulvestrin alone. So although the intention to treat population didn't show a huge difference with the addition of um, pictolisib or the PI3 kinase inhibitor, in a sort of a subset of patients, those with progesterone receptor positive disease, there was a bit more striking advantage for the addition of that agent. Uh, the uh, PFS was 7.4 months for the patients who got the PI3 kinase inhibitor, and it was about half that for those getting uh, fulvestrin alone. So this is not proof of principle. It's hypothesis forming. There'll be more work done with this. And as I pointed out, there's going to be an effort to try and determine if there are ways of identifying the patients most likely to benefit. In a, a different setting, giving these agents preoperatively, there was also a trial referred to as the Opportune trial uh, that was presented in which it was sort of a window study. Patients were uh, treated with endocrine therapy plus minus uh, the same PI3 kinase inhibitor, pictolisib, for two weeks prior to getting surgery. These were patients who had ER positive, HER2 negative disease. And this is the schema of the trial. They were all postmenopausal. They had an opportunity, obviously, at surgery and at diagnosis to have sequential biopsies. So there was material for correlative sciences, uh, which is really the subject of this, to see proof of principle if pictolisib did make a difference in terms of changing uh, some of the characteristics of the tumor cells. So patients received the PI3 kinase inhibitor with an astrazole or an astrazole alone. And the primary endpoint of the study, obviously, with two weeks of therapy, is not looking for a PCR or a high response rate, but rather they were looking at biologic effects, primarily effects on apoptosis and uh, effects on key 67 or proliferation rates. And then there were um, efforts to also look at um, gene signatures to determine whether or not you harbored a PI3 kinase wild type or mutant, whether it made any difference, et cetera. This is the schema of the trial and the distribution of patients at the end of the day. 
there were about uh, 26 patients who received an astrazole alone, and slightly fewer than double that who got PI3 kinase inhibitor plus an astrazole. You can see that with respect to key 67, almost every patient with the exception of one had a pretty significant drop in the proliferation rate more so than what was experienced by patients getting an astrazole alone. So the combination of both seemed to have the biologic effect that was being looked for, a striking decrease in key 67. And prior studies have shown with AIs alone, not with a uh, targeted therapy added to it, that if you could demonstrate a significant drop in key 67, even over a very short period of time, there was a correlation with overall outcome. So we don't know that with the addition of this particular agent to an AI, but it is sort of proof of principle that does have a significant effect. You can look at another way of uh, expressing the change in key 67, a so-called geometric mean key 67 suppression, and on the right, the bar graph that represents an astrazole plus uh, pictolisib, there was a more marked drop in uh, uh, proliferation rate compared to an astrazole alone. There was a greater degree of apoptosis in the patients who received the combination than an astrazole alone, uh, which didn't reach statistical significance, but it was a trend in that way. But just as I uh, suggested in the previous Fergie study, this came at a cost, even with only two weeks of therapy, of not insignificant GI side effects and rash, so much so that in the design of the trial, as you can see in these um, this yellow highlighted area, there was a change in dose of pictolisib from 340 milligrams to 260 to try and get better control of the GI symptoms manifested by diarrhea. Uh, there was also hyperglycemia that occurred. So these kind of agents, and this one in particular, uh, does have not insignificant side effects that patients may experience. So as a transition point, the other drug that now is available is palbocyclib. And palbocyclib is a cyclin-dependent uh, kinase inhibitor. And I, I guess the most simplistic way of thinking about uh, these agents is they block uh, the, way, the migration of cells through the cell cycle. So uh, CDK4-6 is one of the targets of palbocyclib. And this was a trial, a randomized phase two trial, that was really the crux of why the drug was ultimately approved by the FDA. And just as a way of background, what it basically prohibits is migration of the cell from G1 through the S phase. There was also some evidence preclinically that you may be able to identify particular tumors who be, may be sensitive to that. And that is those with elevated expression of cyclin D1, RB protein, and reduced P16 expression. These might have been the patients, or types of tumors, I should say, where this agent might be highly effective. And that actually informed the design of the first trial. And the trial was a two-part trial. In the first part, uh, it was patients who were randomized either to letrozole or letrozole plus palbocyclib, palbocyclib being an oral agent. And then the second part of the trial, it actually tried to enrich the population for those who had a CCND1 amplification or loss of P16, trying to build on the preclinical evidence that those might be patients likely to gain greater benefit from the drug. So the total experience is still you know, just a few hundred patients. And what it demonstrated, even in that relatively modest-sized trial, is a fairly dramatic improvement and PFS, a doubling of PFS favoring uh, the um, inclusion of palbocyclib with letrozole. And this is really uh, what drove the overall approval. Now, at this point, the survival data is immature, but as you can see, um, what we have now is no obvious advantage in terms of overall outcome favoring the uh, addition of palbocyclib to letrozole. There's a much larger trial that's ongoing that will hopefully more definitely inform us about the results there. With respect to side effects, the thing we tell patients, and you know, every patient seems to know about palbocyclib that we encounter now and want to know if they're a candidate to receive it. It's really approved in the first, um, uh, uh, first uh, line setting, not in refractory patients. What patients can expect to experience is a uh, low but real rate of uh, neutropenia 
and leukopenia with the drug, and we've seen that. We usually check their blood counts a couple of times within the first few weeks, although it still seems to be relatively manageable, and only in a small fraction of patients is it significant, as you can see. So it doesn't enhance any of the AI-type side effects, but there are unique side effects associated with palbocyclin. Additionally, there are a couple of other agents that are still in, being evaluated in development. Now, whether those will be complementary, they will be Me Too drugs, or they'll have a unique uh, side effect profile that make them attractive, we'll have to wait for the data to de determine that. Are there other things that we can partner um, endocrine therapy with? Well, I think everybody's familiar with the series of Bolero trials that in every which way tries to include Everolimus uh, either with uh, chemotherapy and HER2-positive disease or different settings with endocrine therapy. The Bolero 2 trial was really what led to the approval of Everolimus and had it placed in, in our armamentarium for treating patients with ER-positive disease. A trial of 700 patients, uh, non steroidal aromatase inhibitor patients, uh, patients who had already received a non steroidal and progressed through it. The randomization was two to one, Everolimus plus hexamestane uh, or placebo plus hexamestane. And as you know, the results of this trial uh, demonstrated that the addition of Everolimus in the setting basically doubled the time until disease progression. So it was a fairly striking finding. And uh, again, it really speaks to the fact that uh, we have these abnormalities in a significant fraction of patients. And as you go forward, you're going to see more trials focused on this pathway. The final thing I want to talk about is not necessarily a new drug or um, uh, necessarily a new way of using the drug, but data that was uh, really acquired by John Robertson as he went back almost paper chart by paper chart trying to figure out the overall survival of patients in the early fulvestrin trials. And uh, this is the overall survival data from the phase two so-called first trial that was published and presented uh, several years ago. Uh, the first trial is shown here. Uh, these were patients with ER-positive uh, first-line therapy for metastatic breast cancer, all postmenopausal patients who either received fulvestrin or an astrazole fulvestrin being given at 500 milligrams uh, on day one, uh, 14, and, day, and thereafter every month. And they were followed for progression when the data was initially presented. It was the time to disease progression that was reported. And this was the overall survival advantage with uh, some clear suggestion based on this that there might be uh, an incremental improvement in outcome using fulvestrin at that dose and schedule over an astrazole. And typically we think of fulvestrin as a drug we would use second or third line. And then, of course, now with the other drugs that we can partner aromatase inhibitors with that I just went through, how we're going to integrate this data is not entirely clear, but it does raise the issue that it may not be necessarily the most appropriate place to reserve fulvestrin to later lines of therapy. And if you look at some of the early trials, and this takes you back in time, looking at the development of the aromatase inhibitors in the 90s and uh, early 2000s uh, in metastatic breast cancer, the AIs typically, if you go across the list, whether it's non-steroidal or steroidal, had an incremental improvement in outcome over tamoxifen alone. And then with the first trial, there was a much greater uh, impact using fulvestrin over anastrozole in that experience. So again, this really speaks to the issue that there may be a place for using fulvestrin as a first-line therapy in select patients, not only in terms of PFS, but also in terms, perhaps, of overall survival. And there is an ongoing trial referred to as the FALCON trial that is uh, making an effort to prospectively and more definitively address the issue of survival and outcome comparing fulvestrin to an astrazole in a similar patient population. So what I would conclude uh, from my comments and what we've seen at ASCO last year in San Antonio uh, uh, in December is that there are obviously an expanding number of choices for ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. The most recent um, addition to that list is palbocyclib. Uh, it is a recommended uh, therapy or consideration for patients in the first-line setting. Uh, of course, we have mTOR inhibitors that can be combined with aromatase inhibitors as well, and there's still a role for monotherapy. Uh, 
Although efficacy has increased in some of these trials, as evident by some of the data I showed you, we are changing the typical side effect profile that we have to make patients aware of. And whether it's an mTOR inhibitor and you might experience uh, rashes, rarely plur um, uh, pleuritis or uh, things of that nature with uh, palbocyclib, you might get hematologic side effects. Pictolisib, as an example of PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, GI symptoms. So again, it's changing things. And I think the real challenge, as is true with most of our therapies, is trying to identify characteristics of the tumor that are going to uh, help us define who are the patients most likely to benefit or not from these strategies so we can be more selective. Keeping in mind that, as an example, palbociclib is probably uh, on the order of about seven to $8,000 a month. So if you knew who the patients were that are gonna benefit from that kind of therapy, uh, it would be a highly valuable tool. So I'll stop there, thank you.